Good morning, I have nine o'clock, so let's get started. So apologies for the grandiose title, uh, but it worked wonders with the program committee, uh, uh, apparently. <coughs> so this talk came about, I gave a talk, let me turn this on. I gave a talk at work maybe a couple of years ago now, and it was based on, it was very much inspired by Sean Parent's seasoning talks. And I had a slide in that talk that said, my claim is that this is the most powerful algorithm in the world. And at the time I said, but that's another talk. So this is the result of that, this is that talk. So did accumulate. I want to talk about accumulatable things and start off fairly slowly, uh, gently. So here's accumulate. Um, we, all, we all know it and love it perhaps. Um, one thing uh, I found, one thing to notice here is that it looks like there's a lot of kind of uh, value semantics going on, and perhaps you might think a lot of copies. Um, but I, in my experience, I found that compilers are pretty good at optimizing those copies away. Um, I took a look at this with an instrumented class that you know counted copies and moves, and, and compared it to a version that of, of Accumulate that used kind of explicit moves, and I found almost no difference. The only difference was in the very first input parameter passed to the passed to the function itself. Um, so, you know, these are typical uses. I'm aware this is not what you're here for. This is, this is kind of like what you think of when you first meet Accumulate. Yes, we can compute, you know, triangle numbers and factorials, and this is very boring. Uh, but what else can we do? So, so something else very simple we can do is compute a maximum value. Again, you're all here at CPCon, so you all know this. Um, I hope everyone's convinced this will find the maximum value. By the way, ask questions if you have any during the talk, and I'll try and answer them or tell you that I'm about to answer them in another slide. So we could write min element in a value-based sense um, and uh, do something like this. Uh, we could also do things like accumulating uh, Boolean values. Um, and this is very similar to the, the all of, any of, and none of in the library, except without the nice shortcut behavior. So you might think, why would we do this? It isn't very interesting as it stands. Um, but things become a little more interesting if we look at the signature of the function that gets passed to accumulate. Uh, so it ha these types, you know, perhaps we used to think of these types as being the same, but they can vary. Um, so let's look at things when they differ. Um, so here's a simple example, <clears throat> a more interesting case, again, accumulating booleans, but in this case, it's sort of inspired by Herb Sutter's favorite 10 lines of code. We've got some kind of uh, uh, weak pointer cache here, um, and we've got a function to load. You know, we're asking for a bunch of a bunch of things we want to load into the cache. Now, because because get thing returns a shared pointer, uh, which we can treat like a boolean, we can accumulate across the things that we pass in, and we don't actually want the shortcut behavior here because we're asking for all of these IDs. Some will be some will be in the cache, some won't. For the ones that won't, we actually do want to service all of them and ask for all of them and get back. What we get back is whether we need to uh, service the requests or not. So here, you can imagine make, it, make async request actually does some work and kind of presumably pushes a request onto some other queue. Uh, and then we know from the result of accumulate whether all the things are cached or not. And we can call uh, a service, uh, service async requests. So note. So we don't want a shortcut here, and you'll note the order of arguments to and here. So we're not so we're the cached argument comes second, and we're always calling get thing. So this kind of pattern can be useful, um, just because we use many function results as if they were boolean values in control flow. Sometimes it's actual booleans, oftentimes it's pointers. Um, could be zero results of you know comparison trichotomies like uh, Strickump, um, and you know we write boolean operators for our boolean conversion operators for our classes a lot. Anytime we want to write if x, uh, and that means we can use accumulate to collect those kind of function values. And again, it's similar to the standard library, the new algorithms, but where we don't want the short circuiting behavior. Okay, so so we can accumulate boolean values. Um, there's a bunch more things we can accumulate. Um, and all of these things 
have something in common. So joining strings, we can accumulate into one big string. Um, this is very similar to building requests from key value pairs. If you think about an HTTP request, the headers or the arguments. Um, merging JSON objects, you can imagine that uh, we could accumulate a bunch of JSON objects into one uh, big JSON object. Multiplying matrices is also something we can accumulate. So the question is, what do all these have in common? And what they have in common is that they're all monoids, which you probably remember, because uh, it's been talked about a lot in conferences. Um, so basically, a monoid is a set of objects and an operation such that the operation is closed over the set, it's associative, and there's an identity element. And this is exactly kind of what we need. Um, in fact, a little bit stronger than what we need in some cases to, to accumulate things. So here's an example. I was talking about um, uh, HTTP headers. Um, here's an example of rewriting something in terms of accumulate. So <clears throat> we've got a we've got headers here as a map of key value pairs, and we're just with you know this is a curl. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a C style interface, and we're just building up a list of headers by appending uh, a string of our onto our header list. So this is a raw loop, and we could rewrite it in accumulate style. Here, the, uh, we're just going through the headers again and uh, appending to the list, and we're accumulating the list of headers. And the result here is that it's, it's one expression. Um, there's no declaration initialization split. Uh, if you look here, we, we, here we, you know, we declare curl headers, and then we mutate it. Here, we just declare it and initialize it in one line. Um, so this, this allows us, to, if we like, to use almost always auto style. Um, so once you start looking for monoids, they turn out to be everywhere, and any monoid can be accumulated. So some examples, just a few examples, addition on integers, concatenating strings, union sets, merging objects of all kinds, uh, what we've seen in the Boolean cases, parsing is a monoid, applying AI behaviors could be a monoid, uh, composing images, you know, set intersections, uh, optional is a monoid. Um, and once you realize that what you're dealing with is a monoid, um, i.e. that you can compose, you have a binary operation, and then you can run accumulate, it can simplify your APIs. Uh, this happened um, when I was at work and I was, and I was looking at a friend's code, and he was wondering how to, he had, actually he wasn't even working in C++, he was working in JavaScript. And he had a list of, of objects, and he wanted to kind of merge them all into one object, get all, you know, accumulate all of the effectively key value pairs in the JavaScript object. But all he had was a binary function uh, to merge two. And uh, I, I, I looked at it with him, and then I suddenly realized, well, you know, all you need to do, the binary function is all you need, because you just reduce in JavaScript across the, across the collection of objects, and that is exactly accumulate. So uh, a type can be a monoid in more than one way, and the obvious example of this is integers. Um, they can be uh, a monoid under addition. They can also be a monoid under multiplication. Um, and uh, the identity for addition is zero, and the identity for multiplication is one, as I'm sure you know. Also, any function that returns a monoid, we saw the functions returning shared footer, which we treated as Boolean. Uh, any function that returns a monoid can itself be treated as a monoid, because you can just aggregate the output of the function. Uh, and saying the same thing in a different way, uh, map, so if, if the value in a map is a mono, uh, forms a monoid, then uh, the map itself is a monoid. Because you can imagine, so, so that's a, really the same thing as the function claim, because if we think of functions as uh, regular functions that don't depend on any external uh, uh, input, then you could implement, I mean, in theory, you could implement any function as just a map from inputs to outputs. All right, enough of the abstract algebra. So why, why would we do this and why wouldn't we just write a loop? Well, one thing I've mentioned is that um, when we do this, we, we don't have a declaration initialization split, which is, which is good. Um, it's often easier to write the binary function than to think about uh, summing 
a collection of things. I'm going to say something for you know aggregating. Um, it and it simplifies an API. If you can, if you're writing an API and you can identify that a type you're providing to your users uh, forms a monoid, then all you have to do is provide them with that merging function, that binary function, um, and they get you know accumulate for free effectively. And you also get incremental computation because you can take, you can accumulate by parts, as it were. You can take the result of accumulate and keep on accumulating things into it. Of course, also we get the potential for parallel computation uh, if if we can uh, use something like uh, the, you know the parallel counterpart of accumulate perhaps in 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 the in modern C plus plus will be uh, reduce and its friends and. If our types are right, then we don't have to just accumulate things linearly. We could, you know, but since the monoid operation is uh, associative, it means you can accumulate a bunch of things uh, over here, a bunch of things over here, and when you accumulate the results, you get the right answer. Okay, so this is sort of what accumulate does. It turns binary functions into enary functions uh, because it allows you to operate over collections with binary functions. Uh, it collects, as we've seen, the results of functions whose outputs are monoidal. Uh, and in some sense, because it's, it offers us this incremental ability, it allows us to treat uh, part-whole hierarchies uniformly. So you can, you can keep on folding things in. Um, and that, that, in its, uh, that also allows us to do parallel computation. So a little aside about parallel computation and monoids. Uh, you can see here, basically, why parallelism works on a monoid. You've got uh, identity. This, this is the identity. doesn't matter if we have a thing here because we've got an identity which is zero. This is just adding up numbers. And you can see that we get the right thing because the operation is associative. Um, here is another example of computing an, uh, a mean. Um, and this just involves keeping track of the pair of things, the count of numbers and the sum. And we keep track of those separately. And again, we get the right answer because the operation is associative uh, and we have an identity. And so reduce, which is new in C17, is really the same as accumulate, except that the sequence can be processed in any order, perhaps according to policy. Um, and it works because of associativity. But what you get is you gain the parallelism, but you lose the type variation because to have parallelism, I think you need, you know, it basically assumes that you're, you're doing a generalized sum of things of the same type. Um, but if you're, if you're actually using things of different types, then there's probably a linear computation required to keep folding things in. Uh, if you work in big data, then monoids really are everywhere. Um, some examples of that, you've got regular and decayed averages, top, top end calculations, uh, Histograms. A histogram is just a bucket of, you know, a, a bunch of buckets of values. You can imagine how to combine two histograms. You simply add the buckets together, you know, bucket-wise. Uh, a bunch of uh, probabilistic uh, data structures are also monoids. Things like Bloom filters, distributions. Um, Hyperloglog log is a a data structure which allows you to count uniques uh, probabilistically. And again, uh, this is so. This link, this is just a screenshot from um, a good site which uh, allows you to play with hyperloglog -log a bit. The basic of hyperloglog -log is that you're keeping uh, a register file here, and each one of the values in this register file is computed with a, a max operation according to the observable bit field you've seen. And so it's trivial to merge multiple register files. You just do a bucket-wise max, and that itself is monoidal. And so the whole thing becomes accumulatable. Uh, but that's beyond the scope of this talk, so you can look it up on your own time. Um, so monoids and semigroups, semigroups are, are monoids with the relaxed, uh, with, you don't need an identity to be a semigroup, you just need associativity. Um, but they're the key to parallelism. And the other key is the ability, this ability to combine summary data. So for example, with the distribution stuff, um, if you've got, uh, uh, distri distributions can be combined. So if you've, if you've done expensive training on your data set to form a distribution, let's say you, you, 
you, you have uh, programmer salaries in Europe and programmer salaries in the US, and you, you do training on both of those sets and you, you form two different distributions, you, can, you don't have to, in order to combine the distributions, you don't have to redo the training on the combined set. You can just combine the distributions uh, because uh, that's, what, um, this, that's what monoids uh, do for you. Anyway, so that was a little aside. Now let's get on to some, some C++ and look at accumulating other things. So right now, accumulate works on linear sequences. So how could we make it work on multi-dimensional structures. So one thing we could do if we had a binary tree or something is just define the linear traversal on it in the usual way. Um, and this would work if we could do that. Uh, the nodes of the tree are still homogeneous. What if the tree was a little more complex like a, let's say a JSON object is a familiar example of a, of a tree-based a tree -based structure that is fairly heterogeneous. So, so here's accumulate, the signature of accumulate. Now, the insight here is that um, the initial value t is really dealing with the case when we have an empty sequence. And the binary operation deals with the other case when we have a non-empty sequence. So we really have two things we're dealing with. And this is similar to how vectors and sequences are defined in functional languages. We can think of sequence accumulation as, as these two cases. So Either it's an empty vector, or it's a vector consisting of, you know, element plus vector. So this is kind of a recursive definition, and if we think of accumulate in this way, it's the key to accumulating nonlinear data structures. So here's an example of, of the accumulate that we know, kind of written in that style. So if we think of the initial value, not as a value, but a function to call in the case of an empty vector, and, and the binary operation is, of course, the other function of call. Um, then accumulate looks something like this. Now, it's recursive. We wouldn't use this. But this, this is the key to <coughs> getting to accumulating other things. So here is a simple JSON value written as a variant. Uh, and if you're familiar with JSON, I mean, it can just be these, these six things, bool, number, string, null, or an array of array of JSON values or a object which is a set of key value pairs where the keys are strings and the values are JSON values. So in order to accumulate this, you know, so in the vector case we had, or in the sequence case we had, we had two functions, one to deal with the empty sequence and one to deal with a sequence with something in it. Because we have six options for the JSON value here, we need six functions. Luckily, these, these functions are pretty simple. So let's look at just accumulating, uh, rendering a JSON data structure uh, with an accumulation. So we know how to render a bool, a double, a string, and a, and a null. These are all trivial. Um, we know how to render an array. All we do is render square brackets either side, and we iterate the array, and we render each value in the array. Um, I didn't put up the code to join here, but you can imagine what it does. It just joins together the strings with the, with the comma in between. Um, and similarly, for the JSON object, how we render an object is very much the same. We render the, the braces either side, and we just iterate through the, the effectively the map, and we render the first, the first, uh, the first in the map is the string, and the second in the map is itself a JSON value, which we make a call to render. Okay, so these six functions, I hope you agree, are all simple to write. And then, in theory, all we would need to do is call our, call our uh, multi-dimensional accumulate, which I'm just calling fold because it's shorter, a shorter word. Um, and we pass it these six functions to deal with the six cases in the JSON value. And, J and we pass it the JSON value, obviously. So um, there is a way to write this function. I'll, I'll go through. This is one way to write it. Um, it involves a little uh, templatory. So we've got, uh, it takes a variant of, of some size. In this case, a JSON value is a variant. Uh, and it takes a bunch of functions, one to deal with each value in, that's possible in the variant. And we just delegate to this fold at function, which we, which we call, the, which we call with the, the index that's actually active in the variant. 
So in this case, um, remember that um, we're not providing an initial value here. Effectively, it's implicit in, in dealing with each of the six cases. <clears throat> okay, so this fold at uh, is itself uh, a function which ends up, now in, in my formulation here, I have a recursive template definition coming up. There may be better ways to do it. Um, but basically, we're given six functions, we're given a variant, and we know the active index in that variant. And so my basic, what, what I basically do here is um, form the uh, index sequence uh, for those, for those uh, of size six, and step through until I hit the one that's equivalent to the index. So um, that's what this is doing. So this my function list. I'm effectively consing down the function list. Here's the head and the tail of the functions, and I'm saying uh, if actually I'm not forming an index sequence. If someone has a formulation that does form an index sequence, it might probably be faster than the recursive template definition. Uh, but <coughs> so this is the uh, variant index, and we're saying if if this is equal to our template parameter, then we must be at the right function. Um, and so we just call the function on the uh, and getting the value out of the out of the variant. Um, otherwise, we recurse uh, and we just go to the next template. Um, and uh, the final, you know, the the end case is this actually never gets called. Uh, but if we run off the end, it never gets called because of the static assert saying that we must have enough functions to deal with the things in the variant. Uh, but if we run off the end, this deals with the recursion. This deals with the uh, termination of the type recursion in particular because the return value R here uh, is, is needed because uh, it is computed from just assuming that these things all return, all return the same type. I just compute it from the result of the first one. Jason. Uh, yes, F and F, F, Fs are callable objects. Yeah. And they're all things that you're not actually storing anywhere, right? No, not storing them, yes. I'm just wondering what the advantage is to being forward on all of these open reference. Oh, so, there, uh, yes. There, is there an advantage to forwarding rather than const reference? Um, forwarding, but, if they're call, if the callable things are not, do not have a const call up or they're discrete, which is actually called const reference. Oh. Right. Okay. So, yes, I'm using, I'm using uh, forwarding references here. The comment is that um, maybe const references could be usable, but then um, if the thing doesn't have a const uh, operator, a call operator, then that wouldn't work. So, Fortunately, the compiler can't. Uh, yes, and it would be a compile error, indeed. So basically, this this little bit of code is just saying, at the end of the day, uh, take your variant, take your bunch of functions, and whichever value is active in the variant, call the appropriate function on that value. Um, and then. Uh, right, so because it's recursive, now presumably the function itself then ends up, remember the recursive definition of like uh, printing the array or printing the JSON, it would then result in recursing and accumulating the variant. Uh, so when you look at the signature of this function, it looks a lot like visitation, um, and it is fairly similar. So. I mean, from that sense, accumulation is perhaps not that far out of our everyday you know, experience. <clears throat> so this, this is a generic accumulate for variants, or at least one formulation of it. Um, and, but if you, don't, if you don't have a variant, if you just have a recursively specified data structure in some way, you can still accumulate that using the same, the same idea. Basically, you have a function for each uh, possible sort of, uh, in functional languages they're called constructors, but each possible thing that you could have in your, in your data type, 
uh, and use this kind of visitation pattern to accumulate the thing recursively. Uh, yes, yeah. Right, right. So the comment is, um, yes, you need n functions for your n possible values, and so your, your recursion here, the way I've formulated it in terms of a recursive template is order n. Um, I'm not claiming that my formulation is the best. I'm just saying here's what's possible with accumulation. So I welcome anyone who has better ideas to make this faster. Your yeah. recursion is great. I've used a similar technique and on Clang GCC and MSGC, it looks like it just compiles to a switch statement. Like if... Okay. If, if. So, so Vincent has the experience that um, a, a similar thing he used actually was well optimized by the compiler to something like a switch statement. Okay, so Using it, why would we do this? Because it separates the traversal of our data structure from the operation that we need to do on it. And as you, as you could see, writing those rendering functions was trivial. And having the way to just run them over the data structure um, allows us to you know, separate out what we're doing from the traversal. And so we could do lots of other things. So we saw like rendering the tree as a string. We could compute things like depths or, depths or fringes of trees. We could, you know, looking further afield, we could do things like lighting contributions, maybe if you have a quad tree or an arc tree, something like that. You could do sync graph operations, and the list kind of goes on, you know. These are, these are typical recursive data structures in my line of work. Um, I'm sure you could think of your own. So this, this technique is useful when you have a kind of a heterogeneous hierarchy um, that might be difficult to define a linear traversal for. You know, if you have a plain binary tree, you might still want to provide a a linear traversal of it, uh, you know, depth first or whatever. Uh, but but this is a heterogeneous uh, way to do that. So we've seen how to accumulate. Um, you know, accumulate gives us accumulation over a sequence. Um, that that technique gives us that technique gives us accumulation over a uh, heterogeneous hierarchy. Let's look at heterogeneous sequences, aka tuples, if you like. So this is accumulate again. So type one and type two here to the binary operation uh, might be different. So what this is saying is that we know how to fold values of type two into type one. So what if we just allow type two to be different every time? Um, and the accumulator, the accumulator stays fixed, but we know, this is saying we know how to fold all kinds of things into the accumulator. Uh, and there's one obvious example of this, which is practically ubiquitous, and it's just uh, outputting to an O-stream. Effectively, this is saying we know, we know how to fold tons of things into an O-stream. We, you know, we write uh, these functions every day. And so if we had something like this, uh, a fold for tuples, then we could expect output like this. So in this case, there's a generic lambda, which just says you know, we know how to fold a ton of things into an O-stream. Um, and there's a tuple, and we, we call fold, and we pass it the tuple, and then our, our initial value here is actually C out, um, and, then, and then it just ends up outputting all that stuff to C out. Um, <coughs> now this is possible as well, and, and one formulation of it is very similar to uh, the, the variant thing that you already saw. Now one, one thing, uh, providing C out here, <clears throat> I had the thought that I could uh, we could structure this function to to take in some sense the empty tuple um, rather than you know what we saw before with variant was we didn't have initial value because we effectively that was implicit in dealing with every case that the that the sum type the variant could be in. Um, in this case, there's a choice between either providing the initial value, the initial O stream here. Um, or somehow 
you know, making that function deal with empty tuple, and that would be the case where we provided effectively the initial value. Um, either way is possible. I think this way for this use case is a little cleaner. Um, and, and the fold for tuples looks something like this. Um, I'll leave the implementation of this next size to you guys. It's quite similar to the, to the variant style. It's not too difficult, but actually dealing with streams, uh, you know, because they're non-movable, does take a little trickiness, and that's the reason for the decal type auto that I had to have in there. Okay, so, so what we've seen so far. So accumulate gives us, you know, one function, and we accumulate over a linear, a linear homogeneous structure. Uh, if we do the, the, the nonlinear or the, the linear tree traversal just on our homogeneous tree structure, we get something very similar. Um, if we have a accumulate over a variant, then we need to provide n functions to deal with the n values that could be in the variant, but it allows us to accumulate the multidimensional structure and the heterogeneous structure. And then a tuple is itself a linear structure, but it's a heterogeneous. Uh, structure also. So again, we have effectively n functions, although it might be a function template uh, like, like the outputting to the O stream. So this is the empire that we've got so far, and all of these could be parallelizable um, given the appropriate semi group structure. You can imagine that um, you could break off parts of, if you had a JSON object, a very large tree or something, you could farm out subtrees uh, and parallelize those operations and then you know given those uh, results you could accumulate those results back up on a, on a, on a different process. Okay so naturally the question arises at least to me if we have accumulate what's the opposite of accumulate? So if accumulate is somehow folding up a data structure to produce a value then the opposite would be unfolding a seed value to produce a data structure. Uh, and this is something we don't see much in C++ yet. Call that parsing. parsing? Yeah, but I mean, a, a lot of these things um, can be viewed, if you view them through one lens, they look one way, and if you view them through a different lens, they look another way, and which you choose is, is uh, down to you. <laughs> so, if accumulate looks like this, then I think perhaps unfold as I'm calling it, looks something like this. So it takes a function and it takes an output iterator, which we're going to write to, and it takes uh, some kind of seed value, um, the initial value, and the idea is that we're going to call the function repeatedly with this initial value that, that reduces over time, and we're going to write the results for the output iterator. So, so the question is, what should the signature of f be? And how do we know when we're done, right? So these are two questions that arise. So f is going to be the opposite of the binary operation that we pass to accumulate. So if we kind of just invert that, it means that we return a pair. The result is going to be the thing that we write into the output iterator. And then it's going to return the new value of our seed that we're going to pass to the next invocation of f. And in general, the result to write to the iterator could be a range or a sequence of values. So it's not just necessarily just one value, but it could be, you know, uh, it might not just be a char, for instance, it could be a string to write into the, the string that we're unfolding to. So there's a few choices over how to define f. Choice one, or, or how to, so I should say, how to, the other question, which is how do we know when we're done? Um, <clears throat> one choice is to say, well, we'll, we'll have some sentinel value of, of the same type as the seed, and when the seed reaches that value is returned by f eventually, then we're done. Um, we could also say we have a sentinel value of the, the other type that the function returns, you know, the, the second part of the pair, um, which is uh, fine. But both of these choices involve having a sentinel value inside the type. Uh, and from my talk yesterday, I don't really like that. The obvious choice to me in this case is to use an optional 
because that provides you with a sentinel value which is outside of your type. So if f returns an optional, we can simply terminate when it returns no opt. <clears throat> so this is what unfold might look like. The function, so we, we, we call it, we're taking the seed value, um, we've got a for loop. Initially, we're calling the function with the seed value. O here is an optional, um, and you know it, it, it has a conversion to Boolean when it's a null opt, uh, or, or I should say that, that fails when it's a null opt. Um, and we know that uh, we can we can keep we can move the second uh, of the pair that was returned, assuming that oh, assuming that f returns something, it was a pair of um, range to write to our output iterator and new seed value. And so inside the for loop, we're simply moving the range uh, to write it to our output iterator, and the for loop terminates when we return null opt. And you know, each time round, it recalls with the new seed. And finally, of course, we return the iterator, the output iterator, because the law of useful return uh, makes us do, uh, says that we should do that. <laughs> Otherwise, the caller wouldn't know where the output iterator was. <clears throat> so here's a very trivial example. Um, this is this is a function that we might pass to to unfold, and this is a function written to turn a you know an Arabic a number into a string of the Roman numeral. Uh, and you can see that um, although you know Roman numerals aren't aren't that great. Um, Hence, this function has a lot of if statements. But this function, I hope you can see, is fairly trivial to write. Uh, you, just, you just go down and down and down, and you're reducing the seed each time, and you're just outputting whatever you need to output. And then your calling code just looks like this. You just unfold that function um, over, your, over your seed value, and what you get back is the string. So that's a that's a you know a fun little formulation. Um, so you know Marshall, I said when I said about unfolding, Marshall said he'd call it he'd call it parsing. Um, fold and unfold really are the same if you if you kind of look at them through different lenses. So you know, or accumulate. we we're, we're, we're conventionally we're taking a data structure and we're reducing it to a value, and and unfold. We are taking a seed value and expanding it to a data structure, but really the seed value itself is sort of you know decreasing each time. So you could say we're taking one data structure and transforming it into another um, with either of these formulations, and you know which you choose to use is really a matter of convenience. Um, as I say, structures are themselves values in this view of the world. So. Uh, between them, you know, accumulation and unfolding allows you to do generalized uh, sort of uh, data structure transformations. Yeah. yeah. When I talked about parsing, I was thinking about you know, we had your fold taking taking a JSON and producing a string. And, uh -huh. and so you, you could, if you had the right set of, uh, of functions, you could have. Um, unfold, take a string and produce a JSON, a JSON data structure. Yes, so, yeah. See, that's where I got parsing. Oh, right, right, right. Yes, yeah. so parsing, thinking about it, so the comment is, if we think about a JSON, you know, the JSON thing we were talking about, the example I presented was, was uh, accumulating a JSON value and producing the string. Of course, going the other way is exactly parsing the string to produce the JSON value. <coughs> so, um, that's the end of the main part of my talk, but I have a postscript which is kind of... So at this point, does anyone have any questions? No? Great, well, all right. Uh, so I have a postscript which is kind of how this talk came about, which is titled The Fruits of Algorithmic Perversions. <laughs> so I woke up one morning, and as you do, I, I thought to myself, if I was stuck on a desert island, which algorithms would I take with me? What are the building block algorithms in the STL? Now, I've watched Sean Parent's talks, uh, like, like we all have. And so, you know, maybe you know, partition, he talks highly about partition. Um, rotate, reverse. These are all building block algorithms in the STL, if, you know. 
Maybe there are some others. Um, so I thought, which algorithm is the most powerful? And what if I couldn't write any loops except for just one to implement the one algorithm? And I was stuck with that. And which one would I pick? And so that was what led me to, to try out Accumulate. So I, so I did. Um, so I looked at all the algorithms. And here they are. Uh, the the pre C++17, there's, there's 90 of them, I believe. Um, now some of these we can just remove straight away. Swap and it to swap. They really aren't loops, so, so get rid of those. Um, one of these in particular, um, Stefan would make an angry face at me if I implement it, so I got rid of random shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then of the remainder, some are sort of binary search style things, uh, which aren't really amenable to linear traversals, and some are heap operations, which also involve jumping around inside your sequence. But of the remainder, there are 77 that remain. These are basically plain loops. And with a bit of jig repokery and bending the rules, I was able to implement all of them in terms of accumulate. <laughs> How long did it take me? Uh, you know, probably uh, a few weeks, to maybe a month of evenings, something like that. Just, just on and off, you know, sort of thing. Uh, so one of the key things that unlocked it was so. So of course, accumulate does work on iterators. Um, but the f one thing I, I, so we dereference the thing that we passed the binary operation here. And if we don't do that, not that I'm suggesting that, you know, the STL should be updated at all, but, but just reformulate and accumulate in terms of, in, in this format, allowed me to treat iterators as accumulatable values. And that's what allowed me to implement all the rest of the algorithms. <laughs> So now I'm the first to admit that some of these, some of these uh, things are a little abusive. Um, using exceptions for control flow is not something I usually like to do. Um, but you know, for things like find, which have the early out, uh, I did do that. Reverse, reverse I was particularly uh, pleased with. Um, it involves accumulating a function. Uh, and as you, as you step down the forward iterator, you wrap the previous function that you've accumulated in a new function, and then at the end, you call the whole stack of functions, and it unwinds the sequence in reverse. <laughs> so the point of this really is to, to say that um, when you do kind of algorithmic perversions like this, interesting alternatives can arise. You know, I'm not suggesting that we should ever actually use those formulations of reverse or, or use exceptions for control flow. But um, you know, with, when you start looking at accumulate, you, you, you realize that you can do other algorithms like find all, you know, a parallel find if, um, a parallel adjacent find uh, might be possible. Um, min element that returns an optional value um, might be an interesting formulation. And uh, or sort with forward iterators. In fact, there was a, I think P227 um, was a proposal that, that proposes weakening the iterator categories of some of the algorithms like sort, uh, and I think, uh, uh, what, do you remember the others, Marshall? I don't, I remember the paper. Okay. And um, it's a really interesting paper. I mean, it's based on some stuff that Stefan Allman over there has done. But, right. Um, but I haven't actually used that, so I don't think it's actually. I see. I, I don't have, I work strong with this kind of stuff. Okay, so, th so there's an interesting paper that, that proposes weakening the iterator categories because right now sort requires a random access iterator and you know, we, we, we know algorithms that can work with forward iterators. Uh, so that would, that would be an interesting thing perhaps. So <clears throat> the, the, uh, really the conclusion of this talk is that I would, I would suggest to you that almost everything can be expressed as some form of accumulation. Um, when, I, when I go hunting for raw loops in my code base, I, I found increasingly that I was, you know, as well as saying, oh, that's a, that's a find, that's a partition, what a, that's a rotate, um, kind of the overarching thing would be, that's an accumulate, that's an accumulate. You can do that with accumulate. That could be an accumulate. <laughs> Not that you should everywhere, that's for you to decide. Uh, but when you get used to seeing these monoidal patterns and things that can be accumulated, 
they end up everywhere. Um, here are some links uh, which you can peruse at your leisure. Um, this will be in the slides, of course. Um, so, oh, you want to take a picture? Go ahead. It'll be in the slides. Okay. So, so really, so anytime you write an API, look to see if any of the types you're providing uh, are monoidal or, or under any operations you provide. Because if you can identify that and document it, then you open the opportunity for your, for your users of your API to get all this stuff for free. Um, look for opportunities where you're applying a function in a loop. If the output of the function is a monoid, it could be a place where you can use accumulate. Monoids are everywhere, of course. Um, and think, you know, consider folding over heterogeneous sequences and multidimensional structures using formulations like the ones I've shown. Um, they can be useful too. And what the, the use they give you is effectively separating the traversal from the operation. You can go ahead and define multiple operations and treat them the same way in the traversal. And then unfolds are another way you can think about things and you can combine them perhaps with folds to produce arbitrary transformations. And finally, algorithmic perversions I highly recommend looking, I highly recommend looking at the STL and, and uh, trying to write your own algorithms and uh, Marshall has a talk about that later. <laughs> and in the end, accumulation is not just for the boring stuff. Uh, so thanks very much. So I have to say, your algorithms are a lot more interesting than the ones in my, mine are pretty. My talk, uh, the algorithms in my talk are pretty basic. OK, so Marshall's comment is that my algorithms are more interesting than his. I'm, I'm not sure that's fair, but. <laughs> Uh, anyone have questions? Yes. Okay, so, right. Uh, so, uh, you can't always use, so the comment, I guess the comment is, um, Sometimes you have, you, you try to use accumulate, but you can't because you don't have iterators. Um, so the, the non-iterator accumulate or the accumulation over um, things other than iterators is pretty useful and, and worth generalizing, do you think? Cool. Vincent, you have a question? So you gave the example of Roman numerals, but are, are there any other um, examples for the, uh, the unfolding? Like uh, OK, so other examples of unfolding. Actually, I so unfold is is a is a thing that happens in in functional languages, and I went to a friend who's a, a pretty who's a you know pretty au fait with with that kind of thing, much more up to date than I am. And I and I asked him, you know, at a functional meetup group, I said, uh, it looks like unfold is very similar to fold. What where would you use one and where would you use another? And in typical fashion, he said, well, they're both you know they're both um, sort of implicit things you can do on a sequence. He, he, he gave an answer which wasn't terribly satisfying. Um, I, I think it makes sense, um, maybe it makes sense just by convention for, for thinking about the either reducing a data structure to a, what we might think of as normally a value or unfolding a seed. I mean, it's similar in some sense to generate or generate n when you're, when you're but then you're, you know, you're using a seed value, you're calling a generator function to fill in the sequence. Um, I don't have a hard and fast rule to say you should use this unfold here and accumulate here, uh, but they are quite similar. Um, yeah. Marshall, well, like You'd call it factory? Yeah. yeah, so so unfolding, parsing, making objects, in some way, de deserialization. Right in the back. The, so, <laughs> factoring a number could be viewed as unfold in a in a 
highly unperformant manner, <laughs> is the comment. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling that when you fact, you know, factoring a number is a pretty well, well, uh, well understood and attacked operation, and I doubt that Untold would be. It's true. New approaches, new new approaches, and as I say, algorithmic conversions are a good thing. <laughs> So the comment is that the uh, folding heterogeneous things looks really powerful, similar to composing functions. Yes, function composition is a monoid. Um, so, so you could, you could do that. And well, uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, STL two is, you know. Coming, perhaps, write a paper. <laughs> yeah, the, the most powerful thing to convince people that something is really useful is to have something that's really useful. Yes, that's true. If if, there, if there's an implementation which which you can show the the committee um, is being used and solving a problem, that that does a lot to to get in their attention. I mean, I had I did that with I did searcher stuff for C plus plus seventeen. Having an implementation in Boost that I could point to that people were using was a yes. powerful Yes, the, 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 the searching stuff that Marshall did for 17 um, is an example of that. Also, I would say the uh, special math functions are an example of that. There was already, you know, special math functions aren't something that I'm likely to use in my everyday, but there was already, you know, there is a, a community that, that wants them. There was already a high quality implementation. Um, and on the reverse side, you know the 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 implementation thing is the one of the reasons why uh, concepts aren't yet in the standard, but still in the TS because there's not enough implementation uh, experience yet. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that in the closure community, the transducer pattern is basically uh, a realization of the idea that all the algorithms in the computer are doing uh, turn into accumulation, and there are a couple of you know twenty five hundred or Right, so the observation is, yes, uh, in Clojure, um, if you've watched Rich Hickey's talk on transducers and followed that stuff, you'll know that um, transducers are a, a similar thing where it's sort of teasing apart traversals from, from uh, what you're doing to the data structure. And in similar fashion, everything can be implemented in terms of, of folds and transducers. Uh, yeah, this is, this is very much, you know, I'm cribbing everything from functional languages here. <laughs> So, <laughs> but hopefully, you know, giving it a C++ spin and, and showing where it might be useful. Uh, was there a question over here? Yes? I was going to say also that um, unfold, I think, could be reformulated uh, to be a fold instead of a push, um, where it's sort of a factory for something that you can iterate over. Um, and then you can use unfold for things like your, the value you're unfolding Okay, so yeah, that would be interesting. So, so the idea is um, if you formulated unfold in terms of uh, a pull rather than a push, you could have, well, the, the example given was an MPEG decoder pulling frames off a, a queue. Um, that would be an interesting formulation. All right, well, thank you very much.